So, Tant Nhat uh, thanks again for coming. I know you have a busy uh, book launch schedule. Um, and uh, as I said in, in the open, uh, this really is a, uh, among other things, a how did we get here uh, story. Um, and you take it a long way back. But I wanted to begin with a couple of quotes uh, taken from the early pages of your book. Uh, here's one. In the early 2010s, Burma was the toast of the world. As the generals appeared to be giving up power, everybody, at least in the West, began to believe that the country was in the midst of an astonishing transformation from the darkest of dictatorships to a peaceful and prosperous democracy. Burma was a morality tale that seemed to be nearing its rightful conclusion. Then the morality tale came crashing down. And Tant has one other, uh, I guess you could say it's more stark, it's a bit maybe lighter as well, but uh, a fact. Quote, in 2016, Burma was on Fodor's guide, uh, Fodor guides, Fodor's guide list of the world's hottest destinations. By 2018, it was on Fodor's list of top 10 places to avoid, uh, which is a kind of flip remark from Fodor's, but it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's deadly serious as well. So I want to start with an absurdly general question. It's so general that I asked Tant before whether it's okay to ask it. Um, how did that happen? I mean, that's uh, just taking that last thing. That's two short years. Uh, and uh, if you were to pick on a couple of key things in brief that you think uh, are to blame or the causes for that, that rapid decline in, in what's happened there, what would you emphasize? Well, I mean, I, in a way, I think, first of all, let me say thank you very much for, for having me. It's great to be back at the Asia Society and to see everyone uh, here tonight on this, on this rainy, cold day. Um, I, I guess, I mean, it's, in a way, that's an, it's an easy, uh, easy question. I mean, from 2016, uh, over the next couple of years, the new government under uh, Duan Sasuji, the NLD government, uh, was disappointing to some people in, in different ways. Some people were critical of of the government's uh, handling of the economy. Some people were critical of the direction of the peace process. But at the same time, on those issues, there were many people who were relieved that Burma was finally coming out of decades mm -hmm. of dictatorship or quasi-military government and were really happy to see the NLD in power. I think it was the Rohingya issue, the violence, uh, the, 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 the expulsion and movement of hundreds of thousands of people across the international border, live and on, on television, that changed uh, the image of the country so rapidly over such a short period of time. Uh, but going back to that first quote that you mentioned, I think, I mean, I guess in a way what I've, I've tried to imply and, and, and uh, say in the, in the start of the book is that I think that framing of things was always a bit mistaken. You know, the idea that there had been this miraculous transition, that Burma in, in 2011, 2012 was on this inevitable path towards peace and prosperity and, and, and good government and democracy was always a flawed thing. And I think I started the book with that because I think it was important uh, when I wrote the book in 2017, 2018, uh, to have a more forensic kind of analysis of exactly where we were and, and, and what had happened over the previous 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, well, when you say flawed assumptions, I'm reminded of uh, something you get at as a key theme in here, but uh, uh, the phrase that I'm about to paraphrase because I can't quote it exactly actually came from um, someone you single out for praise in your book, and there are not that many people you single out for praise, was Ambassador Derek Mitchell, uh, who uh, served uh, after the transition or during the transition for the United States in, in, uh, in Burma. And um, he said that there were way too many people who looked at the country through the prism of the lady mm -hmm. and the junta, mm -hmm. as in Aung San Suu Kyi and the military regime. And it wasn't that simple. It wasn't that black and white. It, you know, there's a lot more nuance. I was a journalist, frankly, I'm totally guilty. Uh, and, and my colleagues, to the extent we even paid attention to the country, were always, you know. So what was wrong with that assumption? What was wrong with that prism that here was a, uh, seemed an unalloyed, iconic, wonderful, pro-democracy figure? And uh, on the other side, the bad guys who were uh, uh, as repressive as, as almost any regimes in the world. Well, there's nothing wrong with it in the sense that it was you know, inaccurate back in the, in the 1990s. And in a way, it was understandable, uh, given the record of the military regime up to that point and, and, and the kinds of things that uh, Don San Suu Kyi and her colleagues were, were saying and, and, and trying to do. But I guess it was always just a very small part of the picture. And I think people never asked themselves back in the 1990s, I mean, 
you know, we knew in the 1990s that Burma wasn't just a country that was under military dictatorship. It was one of the poorest countries in the world. It was a country in which a very exploitative economic system was emerging. It was a country that was suffering from years of neglect in terms of the education system and the health, uh, health uh, care system. It was a country that was facing decades or had faced decades of internal armed conflict. And to think that one person or, or just a change uh, towards a democratic regime, however successful, could solve all those things, I think it was always flawed. I think people always knew that. I think it was just that you know, it seemed in the 1990s and the 2000s that the military regime wasn't going to go away anytime soon, that focusing on one person, having an iconic figure, having a symbol uh, around which to kind of solidify a sense of opposition to the military regime seemed to make sense because no one really saw alternatives emerging at mm -hmm. that time. Um, I want to get to history a little bit because it's, it's in the title of the book. Uh, it informs a lot of what you say in the book. And in a way, I think another uh, you know, point you make is that we or the people who got involved at these key mm. moments hadn't paid enough attention to the history. But before we do that, can we just get to a little bit more of your personal history? I mean, I went through, and folks have the bio here, but um, I, I, for those who don't know, uh, Tant's grandfather was Utant, the Secretary General uh, at the United Nations. Can you talk about, I think you were eight years old, when you made the f your first trip mm. to Burma, mm -hmm. and you were going to bring the body or mm. accompany the body of mm -hmm. your grandfather home, mm -hmm. right? Talk yeah. a little bit about that. Well, I had never been to Burma at that point, but I, was, I spoke Burmese. I lived in a Burmese home here. I lived with my grandparents and my parents. My grandfather had just died. He had retired from the UN a few years before, and we were living out in Harrison in, in, in Westchester. And my parents flew back with uh, his remains uh, for burial, and that's when there were demonstrations around his funeral. There were riots, and subsequently as well, uh, many people were, were, were killed. Many people, hundreds of people, were arrested around that time. And I, didn't, I don't remember all, I mean, I didn't see all of that myself. I was only eight years old, almost nine years old, but it was my first experience in, in Burma. And so I think both my family history, the things that I heard people around my parents and people around my parents say at that time, my experience in, in Rangoon in 1974, I think made me feel from a very early age that this was uh, a not a good government and that mm -hmm. uh, something that needed to change. And so this idea of Burma being under a government that had really dragged the country down, that was oppressive in many ways, that was violent in many ways, under a dictator at the time, General Ne Win, was something that I remember from not just from when I was eight, but from when I was much younger mm -hmm. as well. It's a really vivid part of the book. Um, so from your personal history to the nation's history, and uh, as I said, you take it uh, quite a ways back uh, to, I think it's 1824. Um, talk a little bit, uh, if you can, about what happened then and why you think, I mean, there's a good deal in your book about a history of nativism, a history of nationalism, uh, that I, I think your thesis would be, and you're not alone, that that informs some of the things we're seeing today. Why do we need to understand that to better understand well, what's happening? Well, think, because I think it's two, I mean, one I'm sorry, is... but can you explain what happened then for... Uh, in, in, in 1824. 1824. Well, in 1824, you had the first Anglo-Burmese war. So the, the, the Burmese, there was a Burmese king, there was a Burmese kingdom, it controlled parts of what is now Burma today, but not all of it. It also controlled parts of what is now uh, Northeast India. Uh, and it went to war with the British East India Company. And after about 18 months of very intense and bloody fighting, it lost that war. And the British began to annex parts of what is today Burma. And after annexing parts of what is today Burma, including Arakan, or what is today Rakhine State, uh, it had a second war in 1852 and then a third war in 1885. And out of those three different wars, it annexed parts of what had been the Burmese king's domains uh, to what became Assam in northeast India. Uh, but a lot of it became the new British Burma, which was in that way an amalgam of both places that were under the control of the old Burmese kings, but also places that had never been under the control of any Burmese king. So I think what's important to remember is that Burma is a modern creation. The Burmese state or the Burmese kingdom goes back a thousand years. I mean, there are different Burmese speaking kingdoms for a thousand years. But the Burma with the borders that we have, including Arakan, including the Irrawaddy Valley, including the the mountainous areas in which there remains armed conflict on the Chinese border, mm -hmm. these were all put together into a, uh, uh, a British Burma, which then became part of the British Indian Empire. Mm -hmm. And that birth of Burma under a British military occupation as a racial hierarchy with Europeans at the top, as part of British India, was the creation of this country uh, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Mm -hmm. And in terms of um, 
well, the phrase you just used, racial hierarchy, the word I use, but use it in the book, nativism. Um, can you tie it a little bit to what you see going on or what we have seen <coughs> going on today? Because, uh, again, that's a big part of your book. It's a big part of the story right now. Um, what's, uh, again, what, what, I mean, I, I had not known, I'm, I'm not a historian of your country, but uh, there is, you make the case that the seeds of some of the mm -hmm. attitudes towards the other mm -hmm. were sown a long time ago. Yeah. I mean, Burma was, was born uh, as part of this uh, particularly exploitative and radical colonial regime. And it was a racial hierarchy, as I mentioned, with Europeans at the top. But it was also a country in which, in the late 19th and early 20th century, millions and millions of people from elsewhere in the British Indian Empire came to settle in Burma, to, to, to make a new life, to look for jobs, uh, to the point where in the 1920s, Rangoon rivaled New York as the biggest immigrant port in the world, at a time when mm. the population of the country was about 13 million, up to 2 million people from, from India or the rest of India at that time came to Burma looking for work, mainly, mainly poor men. And it was okay for a while, there was economic growth and everything else, but by the 1920s you had, you had developed this sort of Burmese uh, identity that was set uh, against this Indian identity. Right. And that was a mix of, I think, people in Burma also feeling anxious, obviously under colonial rule, but seeing this migration of people uh, from outside, from, from, from elsewhere, but also married to a kind of colonial ethnography that began uh, in the late 19th century, but certainly by the 1920s, to see people as either indigenous to Burma or as alien to Burma. Mm -hmm. And this racial categorization of different peoples in Burma under very distinct categories, essential categories, as belonging to this particular group or that particular group, uh, and, and grouping these races in turn as being either of this country or alien to this country, mm -hmm. I think also settled into uh, the Burmese uh, imagining of themselves and, and, and who they, they were. And so with the rise of anti-colonialism and Burmese nationalism, this strong sort of ethnic component and this strong sense of the Burmese as being different and needing to <laughs> assert their difference uh, as a small country that was always at risk of being overwhelmed by big neighbors to the north China and to the west India, I think is something quite central to the political DNA of, of, of the country. And that winds, works its way into, if I'm not mistaken, the, is it the 2009 constitution? Uh, I made my date off, but... Uh, 2008. 2008 constitution, so working almost two centuries later, the same kind of language is Yeah, is in I mean, there. So, so for a while it was fine. I mean, so you have this Burmese nationalist movement. Uh, you had World War II, which you know, many people forget. Burma was the, the, the country in Asia. Um, giant in battlefield. Most, I mean, battlefield yeah. destroyed by, by World War II. You had a nationalist elite then come to power as the British quit the country in 1947 48. And then you had, as well as, as, as a socialist sort of government, you had uh, not a nativist government in the 1950s, but a government that also saw this Burmese identity as very different. But then at that time, because Burma became independent as what was British Burma, there was then a need to try to unify other peoples that were seen as indigenous to the country, like the Shan or the Karen, right. with this Burman ethnic core. And that project has never been successful. And so from the, from the Burmese majority perspective, the project is to assimilate, integrate peop others who are seen as indigenous while holding at arm's length people who are seen as alien to the country. Mm -hmm. But for those minority peoples like the Shan and Karen, this attempt by the Burmese majority to integrate them is seen as a big part of the problem over the last 70 or 80 years. Now by the 1980s under General May Win, with the 1982 citizenship law and a number of other things that were less legal but more uh, practice, um, this sort of nativist idea of the country belonging to only certain people, not belonging to others, grew up in isolation and became further and further entrenched, as I mentioned before, not just in law, but mainly in practice. Right. Okay. I'm going to shift gears a little bit now, and at the risk of doing exactly what uh, Ambassador Mitchell and you have warned against and uh, focusing too much on Aung San Suu Kyi, I do... Uh, there are, I think, fundamental questions, I at least, and uh, I suppose some members of our audience and, and around the world can't help but ask. Um, so I, I, I have only met her once in my life, and it was when I was a journalist, and it was in 1989, just before she was put under house arrest. It was about an hour in her villa, and things were pretty tense at the time. Uh, and uh, like a great many other people, uh, in just the course of a, a you know, uh, one interview, 
Uh, she impressed enorm enormously with her charisma, her quiet charisma, her courage, and everything else, and, and, and then her bravery in the years to come. And um, a few decades later, uh, the next time I saw her, I didn't meet her, you were there as well, 2012 in mm -hmm. Oslo. She mm -hmm. finally is able to get her uh, Nobel, uh, her Peace, Nobel Prize. Peace Prize, which she had won uh, in, in absentia. And there, it's not just a euphoric moment for, for the country, supposedly, or presumably, it's also an incredible moment for this woman. And I guess I'm getting to what happened to her a little bit, but you have in your book a, a remarkable uh, few passages, and I wonder if you could say more about it, where I guess on the fringes of the Oslo meeting in 2012, um, you and Bono, there's all these celebrities who became involved with, with Burma because it was, you know, this cause celebre, and she was who she was, and you go off for a private meeting about Burma's future. Get, put us, get us in the room with, with you a little bit. What, what went on there? Was, I mean, what kind of a moment was that for you, given all the work you'd done in your country? No. <laughs> well, I mean, with Bono, it was, it was, it was, he was very interested, actually. He asked lots of different questions, and he was particularly interested in EITI, the Extractive Industries Tran uh, Transparency Initiative, and wanted Burma to sort of sign up for that. So I remember we had a discussion about that. But I think what's important to remember about that time is that it's not the case that, you know, we had this, this heroic, charismatic leader uh, iconic uh, resistance against the military dictatorship, and suddenly that military dictatorship just sort of crumbled away, right? I think it's important to remember that we, what we have right now is the 2008 constitution, which you mentioned, mm -hmm. which is not a democratic constitution. Mm -hmm. It's a hybrid constitution. But more importantly, it's a constitution that the army has been preparing since 1993, 1994. So this is not something that they gave way to under pressure or as a result of a grassroots movement or revolutionary movement, it's something that they have actually wanted to do for a very long time. And in the late 2000s, when General Than Shui was about to turn 80 and wanted to retire, he not dusted it off, but he finished off this process and basically against a lot of opposition, at least by activists and people outside and by the NLD, put this framework in place, which is what we have now. Mm -hmm. I think the reason we got to that point in 2012 was because two things happened. One is that the ex-generals that he put into place under that new constitutional setup went beyond the script and undertook a whole series of liberalizing moves, like the release of political prisoners and the freeing up of the internet and everything else, uh, that impressed a lot of people in 2011 and early 2012. And at exactly that moment, when Derek was also envoy, Derek Mitchell was envoy, uh, the Obama administration and Hillary Clinton, uh, looking for ways in which to engage the Burmese generals, found that the Burmese generals were doing just enough to justify that engagement and began to roll back sanctions. So, you know, we're living still in the world created in 2011 of actually much greater political freedom that we've had since 1962. And, you know, in many ways, the ending of the kind of isolation that we had from the West uh, from 1990 or so onwards. Um, but it was never the case that we were in the midst of this remarkable transition because of this momentum that had been generated mm -hmm. through a democracy movement. On the contrary, in the late 2000s, the democracy movement was almost on its last legs in the sense that right. people were locked up, hundreds were in prison, many were exiled. Um, and so I think we have to be clear, very clear on the dynamics of change because that tells us a lot about where things might go and where they might not go in the future. I mean, people, right, I, I think in many parts of the world saw this as a Berlin Wall kind of moment, but. And, and actually, you know, I think about Lech Wałęsa, Václav Havel, or, uh, for that matter, Nelson Mandela. But the difference, I guess, is you're saying is there all the other pieces of the autocracy went away, whereas in Burma the military was still there. It was an entrenched military regime which, from a position of confidence and strength, took a step back. Mm -hmm. um, and that some people from within that regime, or the regime that was then set up, decided to go further than was expected. Uh, but by 2014, 2015, the inertia or the, the, the momentum from that liberalization had begun to wear out. Right. I don't think, or to put it another way, I don't think that the establishment, the military establishment in general, had expected to go so far so fast. And there were many other dynamics at play by 2014, 15 as well. I want to get to that horrible series of events in 2016, but before we do, you personally, in, in, in whether it's when you're meeting with Bono and Aung San Suu Kyi or anywhere in that time frame where things were really looking up. 
How did you feel, given all the work you had done in, in uh, you know, a whole range of sectors and, and, and uh, um, you know, yeah. just as a Burmese citizen, how did you feel? Were you, uh, were, were you euphoric? Were, were you? No, I think we were really, I think a lot of us were really frantic because I think it was very obvious from the inside to see how fragile this situation was and how little, how small the window was that we had. Mm -hmm. Because I think what people often didn't see from the outside were the internal fights from within the military, broader military, stop meaning the government at the time, the ex-generals, uh, where the reformist generals were actually in many ways always on a back foot. Um, and I think people, and, and we saw an increasing uh, dynamic of kind of intra-elite conflict as well between different ex-generals, between the parliament and the government. And everything looked, again, much more fragile from the inside than I think it did on the outside. So it was a question of you know, how far could we get things so that it would be hard for things to, to, to turn back or to snap back to mm -hmm. the situation before. And I think, you know, I think people assume that we had a number of years, it wasn't a decade or more, but a number of years before you had to put certain inevitable kind of process, not inevitable, but um, processes that couldn't go backwards into place. Right. Now, there's an unanswerable what-if question, I guess, uh, as to whether had those been the only challenges, could the situation today be better? But the fact of the matter is, um, uh, I was going to say all hell broke loose. That's a little bit uh, uh, glib. But talk, if you can, uh, remind the audience what happened in terms of the initial attack and then the counterattack in October uh, 16, 16 in Rakhine State. Yeah, in October, I mean, if we just go back, if we just go back a few months, I think when Dawn Sun Suji came into office in the spring of 2016, she took a fairly courageous step of appointing Kofi Annan as the head of a commission right. to look to see what could be done to, to resolve the, the conflict in, in Rakhine between Muslims and, and, and Buddhists and more, and more generally. And she wouldn't have appointed someone like Kofi Annan, I think, if she had wanted to kind of dictate what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. So she did that and looking for a sustainable solution. Uh, just as Kofi Annan was appointed, though, uh, later that year began his work, uh, this group called ARSA, the Arakan Rohingya Solidarity Army, emerged, attacked uh, government uh, security forces. That led to a, a, a ferocious response. You had the first wave of uh, tens of thousands of refugees going to Bangladesh. Uh, the Rohingya issue, which had been on people's minds anyway because of the boat crisis a couple of years before, mm -hmm. where you saw people uh, trying to flee towards or, or move towards Thailand and Malaysia, uh, that became front and center of people's consciousness about Burma. Um, and over the next several months, over the late 2016 and, and 2017, uh, the, the tensions rose. I mean, on the one hand, you had the desperate plight of people who were in the country. Uh, you had this new insurgency or militant group that was mobilizing or trying to mobilize uh, villagers at the same time. You had different accounts of violence taking place over those months, over, over every week or every couple of weeks. Um, and in Rangoon, I think, and to some extent in Nebido and certainly on the ground, you had this great paranoia. I think you had a, a tremendous fear on both sides in both these communities. But in Rangoon, you also had this paranoia because people had this um, uh, image of this group as being an Islamist group or an Islamic terrorist group. Uh, propagated, is it correct to say, by Facebook to, to some extent? I don't, think, I don't think Facebook as an institution propagated. No, no, no. <laughs> right. But as a, as a platform, because I think what happened was, you know, for people who don't know, in, you know, Burma went through a telecoms revolution beginning 2013. Mm -hmm. So we went from 2% mobile phone penetration to 98, 99% smartphone mm -hmm. penetration over an incredibly short period of time, and Facebook was the number one platform. So at exactly the moment that people went online, so to speak, you had both the reports of the initial communal violence in Rakhine between Buddhists and Muslims in 2012. Uh, you had people saying whatever they wanted on, on Facebook about that, and there was a lot of hate speech as well on Facebook as a result. You had a strain of kind of, 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 of Buddhism that always saw, not Buddhism, but of, of Buddhist leadership that saw Islam as a threat to Buddhism, and that those ideas were propagated on Facebook as well. Uh, and then you had people seeing for the first time, you know, global Islamic terrorism, ISIS and others in Syria, in Iraq, live and on, on color, on, on Facebook videos. And all of these things, I think, merged in people's minds, this idea that there was this Islamic threat. And then here's this new militant group attacking, uh, attacking government forces in, in Arakan. I think that had an effect of creating this wave of paranoia that might have then been stoked up by different people as well. So when Arsa attacked again in, in August of 2016, 
2017, uh, just as Kofi Annan uh, submitted his report, um, the whole, I, don't, I wouldn't say the whole country or the whole society, but I would say that the atmosphere was there for the army to respond in a no-holds-barred way mm -hmm. uh, and enjoy full support in, in, in doing so. So hindsight is always a tricky thing, but um, back to Aung San Suu Kyi for a moment. So there, as you say, there's this paranoia being stoked, however it's stoked uh, throughout the country. There are hundreds of thousands now, people who are crossing into Bangladesh or stuck at the border or whatever, and by the way, bringing with them these just absolutely horrific stories, uh, in some cases pretty well documented, mm -hmm. of what has happened along the way. And what I guess I've never quite understood, and it is a hindsight question, is with all the, uh, the, the moral capital or currency that, that Ms. Suu Kyi had in her country, around the world, um, because it's often said, well, you know, she couldn't come out and take a big stand because of public opinion in her country or because of the, the hold that the military had. Uh, could she not then, could she not now? Uh, you know, I guess she's lost some of that moral currency or a lot of it. But could she not have, uh, you know, been brave in the way she had been as a dissident and said to her people, you know, Yes, we have an issue with this uh, with this group. Uh, yes, we're, we're not going to condone and sit still when there's all this violence, but we're also not going to condone all this horror that's happening to the Rohingya. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, I mean, it's a, it's a couple of different things. I mean, one is you had that general mood on social media, but I think you also have to ask yourself, you know, does that really matter? I mean, like I said, social does media would really matter. No, the, the sort of mood in social media, how reflective of is, is it of the rest of the country? Right. I remember also speaking to young Burmese people around that time in 2017 who also said, don't take this too seriously in the sense that people, ha you know, people write all kinds of things on Facebook, comment in all kinds of different ways. It doesn't necessarily re represent a depth of feeling. I right. guess what I'm saying is that I think um, people's attitudes could still be formed in different ways. Sure. Um, and I think what people said at that time, whether it's uh, Dong San Suji or other leaders or people outside, I think made a difference or could make a difference as well. Um, but it's not just about what people say and what people don't say as well. I mean, I think we have to take apart two very different things. One is the specific situation on the ground, which led to ARSA emerging, attacking the army and the army's response and the violence that happened in the refugee outflow. And you have to ask yourself, even if Facebook didn't exist, even if social media in Burma didn't exist, even if that kind of, you know, sort of general feelings in, in Rangoon about Islamic terrorism didn't exist, would the same thing as happen? And I think it's possible, because all we have to look at is the record of 70 years of insurgency and counterinsurgency. Mm -hmm. This is not the first time that civilians have been attacked. This is not the first time that villages have been burned down. The scale of it is different. Right. And the intensity of the feeling because of social media may be slightly different. But again, I think we have to disaggregate. And I think we have to ask ourselves, you know, would what happened in Arakan or Rakhine in 2017 have happened? Um, no matter what. No matter what. And I think the atmosphere that was created by social media did make a difference, but I don't think it was decisive. I think what did also make a difference, uh, and it's harder to say in a way, is that because it was happening in a more democratic space, a competitive political space, mm -hmm. those people, and I'm not saying Don San Suji, but across the board, who may have wanted to take risky moves or do things that might have been politically um, uh, uh, unsavory or, or, or unpopular, uh, didn't feel they had the political capital to do that. And that's true of the last government as well, where after the, the communal violence in 2012, I think a dictatorship might have actually a acted in a certain way, but in a more competitive political space, no one also wanted to take the responsibility for taking aggressive moves that might have been unpopular. I, I guess my question is, if Aung San Suu Kyi, given how revered she was, couldn't take that risk, who could? And again, she had, at least outside her country, but I think within as well, she had, she had built that... Uh, uh, that capital on the basis of being a an incredibly strong moral human being sure but I think and, we have yeah. just to, just to, I mean yeah. I, I think there's a few different things I mean one is you know what should political leaders be saying uh, in order that 
feelings of uh, racial or ethnic discrimination, uh, prejudice towards others in society, to the extent that a younger generation grows up with different feelings about others. I think that's one set of issues. Mm -hmm. That's very different from has, have specific soldiers or army officers been guilty of crimes against humanity and what kind of accountability is possible? Right. And is it even, a, is, is it even possible in, 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 in this context in Burma to imagine accountability or, or any government acting uh, 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 towards achieving accountability? That's different yet again for how do you create the conditions in which refugees might come home or IDPs might be able mm -hmm. to, to go back to their homes and access health and education. I mean, all of these are, are com very different Mm -hmm. political dynamics, or these involve very different political dynamics. What did she well. wind up doing, I actually, I don't, I don't recall, with the <coughs> recommendations of Kofi Annan's commission? Well, the government has said that they're moving forward on many of these recommendations, but they're moving forward in very partial ways, and I think that's reflective of a number of things. It might be reflective of political will, but it's also reflective of something which I think is really important to understand, which is that, you know, from the outside, because it was a military dictatorship, we assume that it's a very strong state structure that can kind of do whatever it wants. Right. And actually, it's an incredibly weak and fragile yeah, state yeah. structure where whatever is decided in APDAW actually almost never happens on the ground. So how one actually implements uh, the kinds of recommendations that are in the Kofi Annan report, I'm not saying it's impossible and I'm not saying there aren't, there aren't political issues of political will, but I think we have to also realize that there are huge issues in terms of capacity in doing some of these things as well. Um. Now, I don't want to get into all the detail, but Aung San Suu Kyi is not the only one who comes in for criticism in your book. You're pretty withering about the United Nations, about some in the United States. And am I right that basically your, your point is that so much attention was paid to the, the idea of fostering and promoting democracy? And on the other side of the ledger, uh, very, very little, relatively speaking, to development, to how this country that was incredibly poor, ethnic conflict all over the place. Um, I mean, is, is that your... That yeah, I mean, on the one hand, I think, I mean, democracy is great. And I think, in a way, it's about also what kind of democracy we're going to have um, and, and not to think about democracy simply in terms of having multi-party elections and that it, that's it. And in a way, I think if, if an emphasis had been placed on some other aspects of a more deliberative democracy uh, in terms of things like rule of law, in terms of things like uh, freedom of media and building up a strong independent media and independent judiciary, uh, I think those are things are important as well. Mm -hmm. And it's about how do we sequence those things, right? Um, now, no one had the benefit of, of deciding those things because everyone, everything was under the military dictatorship until 2011. But still, I think we have to think about the sequencing of things in order to achieve a, a more sustainable uh, <coughs> democracy. Instead, what we have is that we have this incredibly um, uh, exploitative economic system. And this is what you know, I try to argue in my book, is that you know, people think of the history or the recent political history of Burma in terms of the... Uh, the history of the democracy movement since 1988 and the uprising there. But equally important, I think, is the history of Burmese capitalism since 1989. Mm -hmm. In 1989, the Burmese way to socialism collapsed. The military junta, which took over, transitioned the country <coughs> to a free market system. But it, was, it transitioned to a free market system at exactly the same time that the border to China was open, at exactly the same time that the Communist Party insurgency collapsed on the Chinese border at exactly the same time as that communist insurgency fractured into different militia groups with whom the army regime signed or agreed to ceasefires, mm -hmm. uh, when many of these militia then went into a whole slew of different industries, illegal and illicit, which then gave birth to a certain <coughs> type of Burmese capitalism mm -hmm. that has mutated and evolved over a quarter century and that has mutated and evolved under Western sanctions and in isolation from global markets as well. And a central argument in my book is that it's that system and the dynamics from that economic system, whatever you want to call it, but it's a type of capitalism, which determines so much of day-to-day -day experiences in Burma and the dynamics that actually govern the country. And without thinking about that and where that should go, a simple transition at the top to a different kind of constitutional system is, I think, at best going to be partial, and at, be and at worst, it's going to have all kinds of unintended consequences as well. Right. Well, you've neatly brought us uh, close to the present, or maybe even to the present now, and um, I want to just, and, and we'll come to the audience in a moment, because there's, there are Burma watchers in this room who are way smarter than I am. Um, but it is worth noting, and you do in the book, that for all this doom and gloom, there's been a, a, a great deal of positive change, right? I mean, you've mentioned the country is, is considerably more free. 
Um, that, that great stat you just mentioned, 2% uh, internet connectivity, now 98% economic growth, as I understand it, has, has hit rural areas as well. Um, but going forward, since so much of what we've been talking about is history and hindsight and all the rest, uh, you, you say uh, in the latter part of the book, quote, Burma needs a radical uh, agenda, a new product project of the imagination. What's what's in that? You, you, you've advised the government for some time. Uh, you're sitting now with uh, uh, with the leadership. What, what's and by the way, with the outside world that that still to some extent stands ready to help. Uh, what's needed? Well, you're. I mean, I think for me the most difficult thing in writing the book was to try to figure out whether I wanted to end on a positive or a negative <laughs> note. Right. <laughs> And we, just, by the way, here we love ending on positive <laughs> notes. You know, like, you know, because there's such huge positives and negatives in a way. Like you said, I mean, the country is far freer than for, for almost all people, yeah. and, and excluding uh, many people now in, in Rakhine State and people in the Northeast who are also displaced and affected by conflict. For many people, life is better than at any time in the past 40, uh, 50 years. That's true. Uh, there has been economic growth, and even for the middle 40, 50 percent of the country, I think their incomes have gone up substantially over the past many years. At the same time, you know, you have this is a country where there is intense armed conflict. There is these, you know, not just the Rohingya violence, but other hundreds of thousands of other people who've been displaced over the past 10 years. Uh, Kachin people, uh, Arakanese Buddhist, Rakhine Buddhist people have been displaced by recent violence as well. Uh, you have hundreds of different militia, an exploding uh, methamphetamine industry worth billions of dollars. Um, and then you have these incredibly fragile state structures, a democracy transition that's half finished at, at best, mm -hmm. um, and, a, and a society that's really reeling from decades of, of poor education and, and, and poor health care, where 30% of kids are still stunted, more than 30% suffer from uh, malnutrition growing up. And it's incredible, it's the poorest country in ASEAN, which is trying to rejoin the world as a poor and weak country, which mm -hmm. is almost bound to, 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 to lead to all kinds of uh, different uh, outcomes. And then, you know, so for me, that's almost a 50-50 thing in terms mm -hmm. of positives and negatives. You have a young generation that really, I think, wants to catch up with the rest of the world and, and do well. Um, but then you add on top of that climate change and the impact that climate change is inevitably going to have over the next 20, 30 years. And it is difficult to be, to be positive, I think. Mm. And I think in terms of thinking about the future, you know, I think constitutional reform issues are stuck. I think the peace process is stuck. I think no one has a good idea in terms of what to do in Rakhine, uh, both with the current insurgency and also with the refugees in, in, in Bangladesh. Um, but I think there are two doors that are open that need, to be, that need to be kind of pushed through. One is, I think, you know, before we even think about constitutional futures, we should have a radical program of anti-discrimination in the country, mm. where all people in Burma, regardless of race and religion, uh, should be, you know, uh, should not only be uh, seen as sort of belonging to the country and, 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 and being treated equally, uh, but instances of, a of discrimination being, being actively um, um, uh, condemned and, and, and sought out and, and prosecuted if it's a violation of the law. But secondly, and, and perhaps even more importantly, I think to think through and reimagine what the political economy of the country should be. Uh, the last 25 years of, of economic growth have engendered a system which is far more unequal than anything that we've had since colonial times. Mm. Um, and it's engendered a system that has destroyed a lot of the natural environment in the country. And Burma, unlike many other co poor countries, uh, has so many options. I mean, we can, we can have an economy that's based on tourism, on, on extraction, on manufacturing, on just exporting three or four products to China alone could probably drive a lot of the economy. But it's about people thinking through what kind of society do they want. Do they want a more equal society or not? Do they want something else? And I think that basic discussion of the kind of economy, the kind of political economy we have, is a discussion that's completely missing because there's been a complete divorce from the realm of politics, which is completely focused on constitutional and legal issues, and the realm of economics, which has been completely relegated to technical experts and not to these broader issues about the kind of future society we want. So, so it's a really great and thoughtful answer, although in the course of it, I've I, I found myself toggling between, are you, op are you an optimist or are you a pessimist? I, I mean, do you, do you come out then thinking that those doors to a better future are... I just don't uh, think it's going to be one or the other. I think my, my guess would be that the next 10, 15, 20 years in Burma will be really interesting. 
And I think it's, all, it's going to be a very mixed place where you're going to see islands of growth and uh, innovation and you know, people doing much better off, maybe in Rangoon, maybe in elsewhere. And then it's going to be a place where, you know, just 100 miles away, you're going to have incredibly poor people and, and people displaced by conflict and, and people really have no hope for the future. I think that's the likely thing. Um, but that's not a good thing, though. And, and I think this, this other path of coming towards a much more inclusive society in which there is some kind of direction in terms of political economy, I think is there. I just, don't, I just feel that we're so far from... The, the discourse around that. And I think from the outside also, we do very little to encourage that kind of discourse, I think is a big problem as well. Okay, um, I want to start, I said there are Burma watchers in the room. Uh, my colleague Deborah Eisenman uh, up here in the front uh, has, has been there many times. And speaking of euphoric moments, uh, she and her team helped bring in that fall of 2012, uh, President Tencent uh, to the Asia Society, Aung San Suu Kyi to the Asia Society, all these conferences. Actually, one was held in this room in 2013 to map out a road to prosperity. Anyway, Deborah, uh, do you have a question for, for Tant Nguyen uh, Thank you so much for coming. This was fascinating, and the book is wonderful, um, very informative. Um, I have a number of questions. I'll try to, to keep it to one. Um, there are elections coming up at the end of next year, about the same time as ours here um, in the States. A lot of times in new democracies or new hybrid systems, you know, you're not really running on platforms or any real outcomes. But what do you see happening in this next election? Do you see coalition governments being formed? Do you see um, ethnic parties coming to the fore in a new way that can maybe push forward economic development in other areas of the country? Yeah, I think that, I mean, I think we're likely, we'll, we'll have elections almost certainly in uh, almost the same week as elections here. Um, I think that they will be, probably be largely free and fair elections, at least better than most others in the region, if not all others in the region. I think that the, the election is very much the NLD's to lose. I think the NLD will do very well. 60% uh, plus of the constituencies, constituencies in the country are in the Burman heartland, in the core Irrawaddy Valley. And almost all of those constituencies voted for the NLD in, in 2015 by large margins of 70 80%. You would need a big swing away from the NLD for other parties to win, and I just don't see that happening. I think many people, despite uh, problems with government performance or disappointments, I think essentially feel, look, after 50, 60 years of military-backed government, this group has only been in power for three, four years. Let's give them a chance. Who else do we have? We're not going to go back to a party of, of ex-generals or anyone else, I think is going to be the view of many. And I think others who are more dissatisfied will probably not vote, and we might see a lower voter turnout. I think that dynamic is different among some ethnic minority communities who are particularly disappointed. Um, and who have ethnic minority parties for whom to vote. And so I think those ethnic minority parties will get a bigger percentage of the vote, but under a first-past-post system, and because so many constituencies, even in ethnic states, are mixed constituencies, I think it'll be very hard, even if those parties merge or combine, uh, to do that much better than they have in the past election. I think a fear that I would have is that um, a lot of ethnic minority leaders and a new generation will try to do their best to contest these elections well, to merge some of their parties together. But on the other side of it, if they don't see any greater role for themselves in government, uh, they will be that much more disappointed with democratic processes themselves, which is kind of what we saw in Rakhine State in 2015, 2016. Thank you. Since I still have the mic in my hand, I'm going to ask one more before I pass it on. Go for it. Uh, if that's okay. Um, you know, you talked about uh, younger generations in ethnic states, and I'm wondering, even if you look at the NLD, which many of its leaders are in their 70s, um, do we see a next generation being put forward by Aung San Suu Kyi and also a different type of person? So, for instance, you talk in the book about Ukoni, who was very sadly assassinated, but also a Muslim man, do we see her being willing to put forward people of different faiths to help bring forward a kind of more tolerant? Yeah, I guess we'll know very soon because the, the NLD will have to choose its slate of candidates for the election uh, imminently. And so I guess then 
uh, will know if, uh, and I think there have been different things that have been said in recent weeks about younger people and different people and people who will need to kind of impress their constituencies. So it's possible there'll be a change in candidates. And I guess looking at those candidates will have an answer to your question. But I think even within the NLD, it's not quite clear exactly what direction that's going, but we'll know within a, ma uh, you know, within a couple of months. Maureen. Hi. Maureen. <coughs> I'm Maureen. Another Nelson. great Burma watcher. You want to introduce yourself, Maureen? Um, I'm an eminence Greece. More Greece than eminent. <laughs> I've known that for a long time. So, Thad, how would you, if you were king of Naypyidaw, in elected or not, how would you extricate the, the, the military and their connections? You mentioned some of the stuff that happened with the the, the Chinese, you know, that various groups that are yeah. in the illicit. Mm -hmm. How are you going to extract them, really? And is there a chance for a sort of a, uh, a non-democratic but basically um, acceptable sort of a Thai regime, military <laughs> never going away, you know, because they deliver something? What, what, what are the chances of that happening? Well, I guess the thing is that, you know, with, with Duan San Suu Kyi, I think is an incredibly, for, for many, especially ethnic Burmese uh, majority people, is still an incredibly popular figure. So I think it's, as long as she's around, I think the NLD is going to be the dominant party. But I think in the future, when she's not around, I think you will have a much more flat political landscape of a hundred different, you know, sort of political leaders vying for power. And in that situation, if we continue to have an extremely unequal, economically unequal society with tremendous wealth inequality, people incredibly anxious about the future, where people are mobilizing around ethnic identities and identities on social media and elsewhere, where people are thinking mostly about uh, race and identity issues and at the same time very fearful of where things are going to go in terms of their own economic future, we're setting things up for a kind of populist strongman type figure as we've seen in so many other countries. And I think that's almost the default situation uh, going forward, whether it's an ex-general or somebody else. I mean, I, I mean who knows? Um, I think a point that I try to make in my book, though, is about you know, the military extracting itself from the economy. I don't, think it's, I don't think we need to see it in that way, because I think my sense is that these networks around businesses making money or people making money uh, in a corrupt way or in other ways, uh, the rackets around drugs, around uh, all kinds of different economic activities in the country, are now so entrenched and so powerful. I think they're much more entrenched and much more powerful than any institution mm. in the country. And it's not the army as an institution being involved, it's individual people of, you know, across the bureaucracies, across the army, across society, across ceasefire lines, across ethnic and religious lines as well. And so I think we have this system that's grown up in the shadow of the formal <laughs> state since 1989, that is the thing that's kind of moving things forward in terms of day-to-day -day life and, and decisions. And, and I just think a much bigger spotlight needs to be put on how that works and how that can change. And actually, I think that you know, across Burmese society, people are actually surprisingly very open to ideas. Um, I think if we focus on a few things like constitutional reform, we might be kind of banging on a door that's kind of not going to open anytime very soon. I'm not saying people shouldn't try, and obviously the Constitution needs to change in many ways. But I think this discussion about what kind of economy do we want that everyone can be involved in, I think even business leaders will want to have that discussion. I don't think business leaders just want to kind of leave the economy to, to technocrats and, and, and just an open door to foreign competition. I think if there's a good discussion about the kind of economy that we want in the future that's good for poor people and it's inclusive as well. I think a lot of people across the board, and I think that's where you get even ethnic armed organization leaders and people on the military side more interested as well. All right, rest of the room. Yes, let's go favor the back for a moment. Hey, thank you guys for the rich dialogue. Um, in terms of the nation... Do you mind introducing yourself? Oh, sure. I'm Dan New. I'm just here to enjoy the conversation. <laughs> um, limited background on Burma. But in terms of the nation that you see impacting the future of Burma most, whether that be mm. positive or negative impact, mm. uh, who would that be? Yeah, China. And it's, why? Um, 
like yeah, most I mean, other countries. Yeah, you know? I mean, <laughs> you know, it's obviously, I mean, almost every country in the world thinks about the rise of China and how it will impact them. And, and I think Burma will be impacted by China probably more than any other country I can think of in the world because it's not just this huge country next door, but it's a country that is now four, five, six times richer than, than Burma, which is, which is new. If you look at Yunnan province, which is next to Burma, 45 million people, its per capita GDP was more or less the same as Burma 15, 20 years ago. Now it's four or five times greater since, wow. since 2009. So just the, the gravity of China next door, whatever government policies there are, whatever China, China's government tries to do in terms of Belt Road Initiative and everything else, I think just, just the gravity of, of China's economy is already having huge impacts across Burma. And it's not, it's not a regulated border. It's not a strong state on the Burmese side that can regulate that trade. It's an open border with thousands and thousands of people and firms and uh, uh, investors and, and others coming across, not on a daily basis, but on a weekly, monthly basis. And I just, I just don't see, given everything that we've said about the situation in Burma today, that Burma will have anything like the capacity to manage and regulate what could be a great opportunity, mm -hmm. having this, you know, one of the fastest growing markets and, and big markets in the world right next door, to successfully exploit its position next to China. And instead, you will have this unregulated border. And I think there's already a perception that China, Chinese projects, Chinese economic uh, projects, uh, fuel corruption, lead to environmental damage, uh, displace people from the land. And I think we're also setting things up for potential, um, what's the word, more tense situation mm -hmm. between uh, China and China's economic sort of agents in the country and, and, and the local population as well. I was going to ask about that, just a quick follow-up. Is there a, uh, to the extent people have opinions about that, I know the Japanese have been quite involved in, in development in other countries. Do they, uh, does, do, 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 does the average citizen, uh, in your experience, have opinions about, you know, who they'd prefer to come in with a big project or a no, I think, I think you can divide it in a few different... I mean, I think the average poor person in the country probably right, doesn't no think idea. about this very much, except those that have been directly impacted because yeah. their land has been confiscated by a project that's Chinese yeah. or something else. Um, I, I think there are, on, on the other hand, I think there are a lot of people and a, and a new generation of people in places like Shan State or in Mandalay who have benefited from Chinese investment and, and Chinese business partners. And you have a lot of young people who are learning Chinese, so I think we have to... We have to be fair and say that, that you know, there's that uh, element and dynamic as well. Um, but I think in the political class, in the Burmese political class in, in, in Rangoon, uh, the overwhelming opinion is one of deep anxiety about mm -hmm. China, if not outright kind of, you know, sort of a dislike of the idea of being overly dependent on China. Um, and you're right, the China, Japan and other countries are, are, are investing as well. Um, and uh, but 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 not, you know no one is offering anything like what China is offering at the moment in terms mm -hmm. of infrastructure projects and general economic investment. Another question here, I think. Hi, good evening. I am Dr. Marguerite Sainon Seth. I'm the great great granddaughter of King Bajido, oh, and well. I live here in New York. And I went to Myanmar in 2013 and traveled with Ashin Sandima, who was second to uh, uh, UNU and, and, and was in, um, he was exiled. And I got a lot of input and feedback. I spent a month there after the, the country opened up and was very, very painful of what I saw throughout what happened. I lived in Myanmar from 1958 and left in 1967, 68, after my father died. He built the sugar mills, he built the rum and all that. And what I saw was the generals had taken over the country and the places that I grew up in and all that were all, t it, it was very, very painful what, what I was seeing. And I, and I got personal accounts for the, uh, for the 1988 demonstration um, Tan Shui said, and this was from the highest level, that they were to shoot to kill for the demonstration that happened. Um, and for the, for the rum industry, it was very unregulated. And, and Tan Shui said, let them be drunk. Hmm. And I traveled to Mamiu, and what I saw was the, Chi the Chinese presence there, where there was bumper to bumper, traffic day and night. I slept in the monastery on the road to Yunnan. 
and it was painful, the raping of the country that's happening on an ongoing basis. I went to, to, in, in, into, the, into the forest and I saw all the teak trees being, be, being cut. You know, we need help in Myanmar to tra change the, the, uh, what has happened. I, I went to see, I went into Ziawadi where my father built a sugar mill prior to his death. And what I saw was mountains of needles on it with no health care, roaches everywhere, the ceiling collapsing. This is what I saw. The people were very fearful because I wanted to see what the schools were being, how they were. And, 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 and there was a lot of fear as the country opened up. Myanmar needs a lot of help. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if you have a response to that. I, I should, you know, in all the many things you have done, um, the question referred to the raping of the country. Mm. You've done a ton of work. Uh, the, it's called the Yangon Heritage yeah. Trust, is that right? Yeah. About the, just what's happened in the city itself to try to preserve. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit yeah, about that. Yeah, maybe just that in one other point. I mean, one is Yangon Heritage Trust. So we, we, it's an organization, NGO, that, that managed to help stop the demolition of, of old architecture and save the old town in Yangon. But what we've also tried to do is begin a discussion in Yangon about urban planning. And you know, Myanmar is a country which was only about 15, 20% urbanized. It's now increasingly urbanized. And, and urban planning wasn't even a topic. And, and we felt, given the experiences in Bangkok and Jakarta and Manila and elsewhere, that it was very good to try to start a discussion about what kind of cities do people want to live in. And actually, if we think about ethnic conflict and religious conflict and racial conflict in Burma, you know, in the future, it's not going to be the case that people are going to be living in isolated mountain communities mm -hmm. of, of one ethnic group which could have autonomy, people be living together and they're already living together in cities. And so planning for multicultural, multi-ethnic cities, I think, in the country is a really important part of, um, you know, a uh, really important challenge uh, going forward. But the, but the lady had mentioned uh, needles and things. I think you, you, I, what I haven't mentioned yet, but I think is really important also in understanding what's happening in the country today, is that Burma is home now to the world's biggest methamphetamine industry, yeah. which the UN estimates is worth anywhere from 60 to $70 billion a year, which is bigger than the formal economy. Uh, the methamphetamine is produced in northern Shan State uh, in areas controlled by a couple of different uh, militia groups. Uh, the high-end uh, methamphetamines, uh, crystal meth, goes to markets in Australia and uh, New Zealand and Japan and elsewhere, whereas cheaper synthetic drugs go to local markets and markets in Bangladesh, Thailand, and mm. in neighboring countries. Um, and if you haven't seen a recent um, Reuters investigation, you should read it. It's, it's, it's mm -hmm. very interesting. Uh, basically, this investigation, which is based partly on um, the work of the Australian Federal Police, has discovered that this methamphetamine industry in Myanmar uh, is not under the control of different cartels, but under a single mega syndicate controlled by one kingpin whose uh, personal income is believed to be as much as $18 billion yes. a year, um, who's a Canadian Chinese, um, whose whereabouts are not known, but he's sort of the Pablo Escobar of our times. But yet, until now, nobody actually even knows his name. Now we know his name, but, but until recently, nobody even knew his name. So this is just an example. Even if, if the UN is way off and it's not $60 billion a year, but it's $10 billion or $20 billion, yeah, it's a huge amount of money. Yeah, yeah. And it's just an indication that there's a whole bunch of stuff happening in the economic realm mm -hmm. that what, you know, because of our focus on some slice of the politics, we're missing what is actually animating life and decisions in Burma today. Sure. Sanjeev, I'll leave the microphone passing to you. Hi, my name is Susu, and I'm a student at Columbia from Mandalay. Um, so do from Mandalay, you said? Yes, from Mandalay. Um, I spent my first 18 years at Mandalay. <laughs> do you think Burma's religious atmosphere positively or negatively affected the country's development? And if it is positively, do you, how is it positive? And if it is negative, how do you think the religious atmosphere of our country should reform? Thank you. Yeah, that's a good question. I, don't, I, don't, I mean, on the one hand, I would say that you know, it's an intensely religious country. So whether people are Buddhist or Christian or, or Muslim or Hindu, you see so much religious activity, and I think people take their religion incredibly seriously, and it's a big part of, you know, I think how people structure their lives and, and, and think about their future. And, and the good part of that is you see a huge number of people who devote hours and hours every week, not just to kind of religious activities themselves, but to charities and faith-based kind of organizations that do charity work around the country. You see this everywhere from the Baptist Church up in Kachin State to, to monasteries uh, uh, in, in, in Rangoon. And I guess that's a good thing. Um, I think in terms of how it kind of impacts political culture in the country, to what extent it's 
it's, it's helping move forward or holding back the democratic transition, how much it's, it's, it's uh, impacting people's notions of identity, I think that's a much harder question to answer. And I think within each religion, there are also different new intellectual currents. And we see within Buddhism, Mavatha, which is the, the Burmese um, kind of Buddhist nationalist movement, uh, but which grew uh, in, a, in an atmosphere of opposition to what it perceived as a kind of very corrupt and unfair modernization under, under military rule, which, tended to, which has one strain which sees Islam as a threat, but also has many other strains uh, which has kind of um, uh, spoken out against military corruption, for example, as well. Uh, but it's so complex, and I think within, again, each, each religion, uh, you have different elements right now, so it's hard to say. Maybe the only other thing I could say is that, you know, I think Burma is still a culture, for the majority Buddhists, who are 85% plus of the, of the country, um, you know, I think Buddhism and people's thinking about their next life and all of these things which people take very seriously is such an important part of, mm -hmm. of, of how people act and, 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 and plan things. And yet, you know, we almost, when we talk about the politics of the country, we almost never factor in these issues. Uh, that's not a very good answer to your question. I think it's, it's a good question. Um, I think it's really important. Uh, but what the net impact is on, on the other issues that we've been talking about, I think it's much more difficult to say. Oh, boy. A lot. But this woman here. Thank you for another terrific book. Um, could you talk a little bit about the landscape of civil society organizations and the importance or perhaps the futility um, of, of continuing to grow that sector and the opportunities that might be um, paved pave the way for some of the oppor opportunities to put a spotlight on some of the issues you've been talking about yeah. in relation to the economy? Yeah, I think it's really, I mean, I think it's really good. I think it's really good that there's a space. I think it's really good that there are hundreds, if not thousands, of new civil society organizations. I think it's really good that uh, many of them are, are actively trying to discuss things that haven't been discussed before and trying to promote various issues, in a, in a progressive issues, in a, in a, in a good way. Um, I've worked with many different NGOs that are trying to, to look at some of the issues that I've talked about today. But I think it's no substitute for a state-led progressive agenda, which is completely missing in many ways in the country. And this is the thing. I mean, I think you know, it's fine for, for NGOs, CSOs, to be promoting issues around anti-discrimination, and a few do, uh, issues to, to help poor people in the country, and, and, and many do. Uh, but what we need is a root and branch, almost wholesale reform of the state's uh, education and, and health care sectors um, and come up with a plan uh, to, to urgently and, and, and uh, urgently help the 20, 30, 40 percent of poor people who are in, in dire straits despite whatever economic growth there's been over the past 10 years. And no civil society activity can, can take the place of a government agenda uh, to do that. Um, and that's, you know, the government has a $15 billion budget. Now, that budget is eaten up in different ways. I mean, we can get into where that budget goes. But it's the state that needs to be rebuilt around a progressive agenda, right? Um, because otherwise, what's the point of democracy? And, and I think when we think about the parts of the country that are outside of state control, um, I don't think ethnic minority communities will welcome a peace that brings in the state as it is and the economy as it is, which is quite exploitative coupled with a weak state that doesn't give them anything in the way of public services. Whereas I think if we have a state at the center that is genuinely progressive and that provides all of its citizens equally health, education, and, and, and basic social welfare, then I think that is the state in which you can, around which you can build uh, a much more sustainable peace process as well. $15 billion budget? What, what did you say that meth figure was? <laughs> $60 that? billion. 60. Well, that's the UN's estimate, yeah. Yes, right next to you, John. Thank you. My name is Kinue Weinstein. I am a big fan of Myanmar. I went there many times. Um, the question <coughs> is that the, uh, Myanmar has 135 minorities, uh, uh, different people. And uh, I would like to ask you uh, your um, opinion about Rakhine State and Rohingya. You have many different people, and also uh, you mentioned 85 or 90 percent is a Buddhist, but also a religious rate is homogeneous. But in Yangon, as far as I have seen, the Jews, uh, Muslims, and everyone gets along. 
So I'm puzzled why, what's the difference in Ro uh, Rohingyas? You have a whole yeah. chapter on this, yeah. right? There's not, yeah, there's not, there's not that many Jews in, in Myanmar. No. <laughs> there's, there's, maybe, there's maybe 10 or so. Um, I th Sorry. Yeah. The synagogue, a beautiful synagogue exists, and it's, 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 uh, one or two families, and, yeah, and expat uh, people of the Jewish faith who come there. I, 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 you know, this is almost sacrilegious to say in Burma, but I don't believe that there's 135 ethnic groups in, in the country. I think this is a big problem, and I think it's a problem that goes back to the British censuses. I think it goes back to colonial ethnographers that were trying to kind of uh, slice and dice the country and into, to, into recognizable uh, racial and ethnic categories that they could help then administer and, and, and control. Mm -hmm. And the Burmese kind of, you know, sort of took on board this, this, these sort of self-identities and, and, and then used them for, 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 different, for different purposes. I mean, Burma, the British said, the British wrote in, or not the British, but I, a British person wrote in, in 1911, I think it was, in a critical way. He said Burma was a zone of racial instability by which he meant that people in Burma were kind of moving around from one identity to another. <coughs> and he went to one village where the people said they were Shan, but they said their parents had been Kachin and their grandparents were something else and they couldn't remember what they were. And for the British, or the British said, you know, this person says he's Anglo-Burmese, uh, but he's, you know, he's actually this or that, or these Indians come from India and they're actually of this very low caste or they're untouchables, but they say they're Christian or they say that. And people were changing around. And I think there's something actually in modern Burmese history um, in which Burma really is a place where people have very different and mixed and fluid and contingent identities. And this effort to fix those identities, and even worse, to set off these identities against one another, I think is the root of a big part of the problem in the country today. Because then, if you, if you have these essential categories, then you have to ask yourself, do the Rohingya exist as this category, and how do they fit within the 135, or are they excluded from the 135? But I think that framing of the whole thing is the problem in the first place. And I think the more that we can teach kids history in a different way and appreciate that these identities in Burma have always been very fluid and <coughs> contingent and very personal, um, I think we, we mm. come at the problem in a different way and, and, and I think different kinds of solutions will present themselves much more easily. Okay, we have time for a couple more. Yeah, the gentleman there and the gentleman there. Yep. My name is Richard Klein. I've been involved for the past eight years in a, a medical project uh, in Myanmar, first with a Buddhist NGO, and then uh, finally we were allowed to work in government uh, hospitals. Um, it, the government spends virtually nothing on health care, virtually nothing. What will have to happen in the country t for the government to put resources into health care for the people? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, you know, it, I think it, it goes back to, to, to what was said earlier. I mean, the, as long as Burma's nascent democratic institutions are focused on a very narrow political debate about constitutional futures and a few other things, or, or really nothing in terms of substance and policy, um, I think it's going to be difficult. Um, I think on, on the one hand, people know um, that they want better health care. They know they want better education. No one's against that. But nobody is putting on the table genuine plans for a new national health care system. Mm. And no one is presenting different kinds of alternatives. You, you know, we could have an alternative where there's a big private sector for health care. You could have an alternative which, which is universal health care for everyone. And this is how much it would cost and this is what the plans are. But you nobody have is doing Medicare for all. You could have <laughs> Medicare for all. Um, and, and, but, but this is actually the thing because, you know, in, in the West, and in, you know, in countries, the United States and the UK and other countries, I mean, there are lots of interesting, right. you would say frustrating discussions, but also interesting discussions on the future of many of the issues that people in Burma should also be thinking about and debating. Mm. Yet Burma is often never connected to those debates. Mm. And instead, what's being offered in Burma are very stale formulas mm. around just have elections, just have free market reforms, just open up your country. And I think the more that we can use the civil society space that's there, the fact that the internet is free in Burma, to inject a lot of new ideas on political economy issues. And I would say, you know, universal health care and having a new national health care system is a big political economy issue. I think that's what's needed. Otherwise, we're going to go, otherwise, in the absence of that, basically, people will not have the ability to articulate a more progressive agenda, 
with which to, as, as content for their democratic politics, and it said people will mobilize around identity issues, which I think is, has been the bane of Burmese politics since independence. Well, the microphone is passing. I promise this gentleman with the scarf there, just a quick one uh, coming to us via Twitter. Uh, Wayne Goodman, uh, Myanmar needs help. What do you see as the position the United States and its citizens should be taking, if any? Um, uh, and, and I should say, in the book, you, you're, you know, I think you make the point that a lot of American positions that have been taken over the past couple of decades mm -hmm. have been misguided or counterproductive. What, what should we be doing now? Yeah, it's hard to say because I think, you know, on the one hand, I mean, I was, I was always very critical of, of economic sanctions back in the 90s and the 2000s because I think they were counterproductive. And I, and I think in hindsight, that's even, that's even more clear. Mm -hmm. Um, right now, we're in a situation where the Amer America is not a big, um, I mean, America doesn't have a very dynamic uh, foreign policy in, in many parts of the, of the world, <laughs> diplomatic, um, and people are, are <laughs> said, yes. and, 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 you know, people are obviously very much focused on, on, on internal politics here. To be honest, I don't really know what the U.S. could do very differently. I mean, I think the U.S. has tried to, to follow a, a balanced position in Myanmar. They've shown a huge amount of, of focus and interest in, in human rights issues, including mm -hmm. on the Rohingya, but also in relation to the peace process. At the same time, it's, it's continued to, to manage, uh, sorry, to engage uh, mm -hmm. the government and, and, and provide uh, support where it can provide support. So I think it's a good, balanced kind of policy. I'm not sure exactly if there's a, I'm not sure if there's a magic formula uh, that the U.S. Could, could undertake at this time that would really make a big difference. What about, what about, we haven't talked much about private investment. Yeah. I mean, what about that, that uh, conference that I referenced that we had here six years ago now? Yeah. There were a lot of businesses in the room. Yeah. I mean, what's, um, you know, are there, uh, uh, what's needed? Uh, the thing uh, is, you the know, thing to, is to maybe mitigate a little bit of the, the China issue you, you, you Yeah, mentioned. I mean, but I think, you know, in, on the one hand, Burma needs everything. Right, mm -hmm. and and you know the domestic capital isn't there unless you get the meth industry involved. I suppose <laughs> would be a possibility. The domestic, and that's actually not a complete joke because people are now there's now a new law which will legalize casinos in the country, and the casinos in the country have been a huge um, uh, mechanism for laundering uh, money. There are hundreds of casinos on the Chinese border. But anyway, leaving that issue aside, there's not the domestic capital. Uh, to um, move Burma's economy forward at the, at the pace that it, it should move forward, right? So mm -hmm. there's a big need for foreign investment pretty much in every sector across the board. And a lot of companies, Western companies and others, are not investing in Burma. I think a little bit on reputational risk issues, but a lot just because the business climate isn't there mm -hmm. uh, to justify uh, that investment. But I think the problem is in the other direction, which is that until the Burmese people, the Burmese government, Burmese society has a clear vision of the kind of economy it wants in 10, 20 years' time, it's hard to know what the right, right. What the right mix of policy should be in terms of the type of foreign investment it wants to attract, right? There could be sectors where it opens, it up, it opens itself up completely to foreign businesses and foreign investment, other sectors it wants to protect because it wants to grow local companies, other sectors, maybe healthcare. Uh, maybe say railways or transportation or any that it wants actually to be under state mm -hmm. uh, state ownership. So, but it, it's never come to that kind of vision in terms of where how it sees the economy moving ahead and 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 how it wants to see it structured. And I think without that, that also hinders uh, foreign businesses because when they come to invest, I think the government government in general, I mean the the, the NAPDO, the capital, is that much less ready to kind of judge right. whether it wants this particular investment or not. Okay, the gentleman's been waiting for a while. Yes, sir. Hello. Um, if you can use the microphone, otherwise, folks. Hello? Can you? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, hello, my name is Dan. I'm from NYU, I'm from Rangoon. Um, I have a prop. well, not a problem, really, more of a question. So, um, in Burma, we have this issue of accountability and transparency when it comes to businesses, when it comes to, um, say, policy measures. We've seen that with the uh, Justice for Victoria instance where um, there, there has been a lot of problem trying to get the police to solve a particular case. And this problem could be extended to a wide variety of issues, business, um, foreign policy, um, you name it. Um, regarding what you said earlier about um, economic development, well, emphasis on economic development without so much on political, well, I'm not, I can't quite recall how you phrased it, but um, somewhere along the lines mm -hmm. of uh, 
more economic development and less for democracy, mm. I, I, I think, I don't know. So um, do, you think, do you think it's quite, uh, it's feasible in order for Burma to have um, a lot of capital injection without um, sufficient level of accountability? We could be diving right into what we saw with um, Eastern Europe and South Africa and um, well, many parts of Asia where you see a lot of um, oligarchs and you have a lot of, um, mm -hmm. say, regulatory mm -hmm. capital. No, uh, that's absolutely the problem. And that's why I think the focus has to be on how to address that specific issue. Because if you just take the economic system as it is, right, the system as it's grown up over the last 25 years, you see how weak state institutions are, whether it's on taxation or whether it's the judiciary or whether it's the ability of the state to plan the economy. And you just open the door to any kind of foreign investment in competition from China or from elsewhere, and you just let you just sort of turbocharge the economy as it is. Um, you know, you'll wind up, you know, with an even more unequal society. You'll wind up with all the problems that we've had uh, over the past 20 years, but 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 even worse. It's not about choosing between development and democracy. It's about making sure that democracy is about development in the way that's good for ordinary people, right? Otherwise, if you have democracy and people have elections and they choose between three or four different parties who say the exact same kind of, you know, very uh, surface thing about uh, a number of different issues, then, what, then what's the point, right? But you want a democracy in which it's, you know, it's a deliberative democracy, but it's also a democracy that really comes to grips with these core issues, which is about how is the economy going to be managed. And you're absolutely right that, you know, if you just keep the system as it is without reform, um, and you just kind of open the door and you should hope for more investment and, and, and more capital going in, it will just make a lot of these problems worse over time. And I, th I think, you know, th the part that we hadn't talked about in the history is that partly because of British colonialism and a legacy of British colonialism is that from 1948 onwards, Burmese politics was dominated by the left. Mm -hmm. And you had different socialist groups and communist groups vying for power from the 40s, 50s, 60s, right. 70s. And they were all seen to have failed by the 1980s. But that collapse of the left means that there is no language that's seen as credible to articulate a more progressive agenda in the country. So we live in the kind of the aftermath of this collapse of, of different socialist and communist attempts or experiments. Um, and people, I think, want something very different from a crony-run economy, but don't really have the conceptual framework uh, around which to try to change things. And maybe just lastly to say that you know, on all of these kinds of issues about institutional reform and the ability to deal with different cases, you mentioned the Victoria case, which is a child sexual abuse case. Um, you know, in a way, the problem is that what you need with you know, these huge bureaucracies of tens of thousands of people who've been, you know, these bureaucracies that have kind of warped and, and mutated under years of dictatorship and autocracy, to kind of know how, where to even start in changing the education system or know where to start in terms of changing the judicial system requires sort of a team of super managers. And you know, the NLD and politicians today, for no fault of their own, they've been locked up for, for decades, are not super managers, right? Mm -hmm. And you kind of need to know how do we sequence, where do we start, who do we fire, who do we hire, where do we focus on in terms of these different bureaucracies to, to move this forward. I, I just don't see the capacity to, to do that right now. We're approaching the uh, witching hour, and I asked you a, a personal question about that trip you made when you were eight years old, and I just was thinking, uh, would love to know if you don't mind sharing. You're still young. With all these problems in your country, what do you want to do next? What are your hopes, dreams, ambitions? Uh, yeah, I don't know, really. <laughs> I think, uh, I've just spent, it's, been, it's been a big effort to try to, to, try to finish this book over, yeah. over this year, so I'm, I'm hoping over the next few months to to kind of think a little bit about uh, what to do next. You know, I, I, I left to go to Burma in 2007 because I've been working a lot on UN reform. Right. And I thought that Burma reform would be much easier than, than UN reform. And, <laughs> and that was the case at least for a, for a little while. But now, yeah. now things seem very difficult. But, so I don't know is, is the honest answer yeah. to, the, to the question. Right. Yeah. Well, Tant Nien U, uh, the book is terrific. It's The Hidden History of Burma. There are copies in the back if they haven't all sold already. Uh, I also, just a shout out to all of you who ask questions. I mean, uh, they're always uh, of a high caliber here. I'm just struck by how many of the people who ask questions uh, actually asked with uh, personal experience from the country. So thank you all for coming. We'll see you on December 2nd, if not sooner. And thank you for coming.